is the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit produces life, joy, and peace. Never judge a thing before it's time. And so the Holy Spirit gives you the wisdom to have prudence and restraint. The gospel is not only words, but Paul says that the gospel is power. to Christ, that question is settled. You are a son of God. We're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit to guide of my life. So go with me to Romans, the eighth chapter. While you're looking for Romans 8, I want to tell you something about Romans. Ro Romans is Paul's most mature letter. When you're reading the book of Romans, you are reading Paul's, the end of his life. After he's studied everything, after he's lived out his ministry, Paul is at the height of his ministry. As a matter of fact, he's about ready to be executed. Some people believe in a Roman jail, he's decapitated. We, know, we don't know exactly, but that's what historians say. So Romans is Paul's major teaching. All of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, all of these other letters were written before Romans, even though Romans appears before them in the New Testament. And so this is kind of the summary. This is kind of, let's call it Paul's dissertation. If you want to know what Paul's thinking as a mature Christian, read the book of Romans. It's, it's what some people call his systematic theology. This is Paul's mind. This is everything that he learns. The reason he's writing it to the church in Rome is because although he did not plant that church, he wanted it to be the most influential church because from Rome, he would change the world. And so Paul is giving them, Paul has a project. Say with me, Paul has a project. Listen, if you don't have a project in life, if you don't have a project in life, you could go in any direction and not find meaning. You were created with a purpose. You were created with a destiny. And some of us are walking around with no, we're just beating the wind, just beating it. And so Paul had a project. Say with me, Paul had a project. Paul's project was to build the church and to expand, this, and to expand the kingdom. And in Romans, he's giving them all of the theological and all of the philosophical and all of the principles so that they could be a powerful church. Say, some, say to somebody, we need fundamentals. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We need fundamentals. And so Romans are the fundamentals of the Christian faith. And in Romans 7, 8, and 9, Paul is giving them the life of the Spirit. Say with me, the life of the Spirit. Right? You heard if you came on Tuesday or on Wednesday, I taught, uh, well, Wednesday, I taught about Galatians and I talked about the life of the Spirit, the Zoe Numa, the life of the Spirit. Say with me, the life of the Spirit. Not, listen to me, not the experience of a Sunday on a spirit. Not about when you hear your favorite worship song in the car. Everybody ever hear their favorite worship song? And it sends chills up their spines? Yeah, it's not, that, that may be an experience with the spirit. That may be a moment of the spirit. Paul says those are good and valid. But Paul's challenging the church to something deeper. A life of the spirit. Where every dimension of your life, every dimension is controlled, directed, and guided by the Holy Spirit. The reason Paul is doing this is because in Rome, every dimension of their life was not guided by the Spirit. It was guided by the Roman powers and the Roman principalities. Touch your neighbor and saying, what guides every dimension of your life? Ask him, what guides every dimension of your life? Is it money? Is it influence? Is it what other people think? What guides every dimension of your life? And so Paul is working with that. I imagine you're with me in Romans 8, chapter 5. Right? Those, read it with me, those who live according to the flesh. Stop there. Change, change flesh to the word fallen nature. Those who live according to the fallen natures have their minds set on what the fallen nature Desires. The reason you translate flesh to fallen nature is because when a lot of people f hear flesh, they think it's their body. It's not. In the Bible, flesh is not talking about your body. Your body's good. Say with me, the body's good. How do I know it's good? Because God made it. And the Bible says that your it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
So when you read the word flesh in the Bible, it does not mean body. There's a word for body. It's soma. The Greek word for flesh is sarx. And so it's not talking about your body. It's talking about your fallen nature, the way you think. Because of sin, the power of sin on fallen nature. And those who live according to the fallen nature have their minds set on what? What the fallen nature desires. But keep reading. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. Next verse. The mind governed by the fallen nature is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is? It's what? Pastor, I have no peace. Then where's your mind at? Pastor, I can't sleep at night. Where's your mind at? Uh, By the way, the word mind is often translated mind, emotion. Okay, so mind, emotion, soul, they're all synonyms. Your mind, your soul, and emotions. So when you hear mind in the Bible, it's talking about your soul realm. It's talking about your feelings. It's talking about your emotions and your process. The mind governed by the flesh is what? Is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is what? Yo no tengo pa. I have no peace. Where's your mind at? How many of you have one of those old grandmothers that has like these phrases that just like, Freeze you. Donde tu tienes la mente, nene? Where's your mind at? Because whatever governs your mind governs whether you have peace and life. And so if you come to church, but your mind is not renewed by the Holy Spirit, whom Paul says he has given us the mind of Christ. Say with say with me, I want life. I want peace. Where's my mind at? The mind governed by the fallen nature is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor does it have the ability to do so. And those who are in the kingdom or the realm or the dimension of the fallen nature cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the fallen nature, but you are in the realm of the spirit. And if indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life. And if the because of righteousness, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Now read this. Therefore, therefore, what's the therefore? Therefore. It is therefore because the spirit lives in you, because you have alienated the hostile flesh. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. 14, for those who are led by the spirit of God, these are the children of God. Look at me. We are in a moment where we have a lot of things struggling for the mind of our society, struggling for the influence of our society. Yesterday I was reading philosopher, her name is Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt is a German American philosopher who survived the Holocaust. She taught at Harvard, Yale and all of these other schools, but she first started in Germany. And she was a student of one of the major theologians of Germany. She was the student of one of the brightest philosophers in Germany, a man named Heidegger. He's one of the brightest minds of the 20th century. In the moment while she's a student of his, she begins concerned. She becomes concerned because although he's one of the brightest minds, listen to this. This, When I read this, it, 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 it shocked me. He 
although he was a theologian, one of the brightest minds, he endorsed Hitler. Did you hear me? One of theologian, brightest minds, philosopher, and several other Christians endorsed Nazism and Hitler. I have a question for you. I have a question for you. How is it that thousands of Germans who went to church every week followed Hitler? Look at me. Have you ever wondered that? How is it that thousands of Americans who went to church every week beat their slaves? They worshiped God on Sunday, and then on Monday they were beating their slaves. Have you ever asked yourself that question? How is it that we could be religious but not be guided by the Holy Spirit in every dimension of our life? How is it that you could be like, just to be close to you, just to be close to you on Sunday, but act up at work on Monday? But mistreat your children and your spouse on Monday. Ask your neighbor, where's the disconnect? Ask them, where's your mind at? So let me answer this question for you. I'm teaching today. Say with me, pastor's teaching today. She writes a book called The Life of the Mind. She says that the mind has three faculties or three functions. Ask me, what are those three functions? Those three functions are very simple. Number one, to think. Say with me, to think. Number two, the will. Say with me, the will. Number three, to make judgments. So she said the mind, the life of the mind does three things. It thinks, it has the will to act, and it makes judgments. And she said that all of modern society has lost its moral compass. It has no sense of direction. No sense of direction. Anything, people retweet stuff and they don't even examine what it says. Why? Why are they just... Like, I like this, I like that. And it's totally contrary to the gospel. They go to Facebook and they enter into these fruitless, frivolous arguments about theology. And, and, and they hurt the gospel. I said they hurt the gospel because thousands of people are watching you have an argument on Facebook. And I ask myself, where is the Holy Spirit telling them pump the brakes? Think before you press send. Think before you press like. I submit to you that Hannah Arant, with whom I disagree a great deal, she said something. She said that the mind does three things. It thinks, it has the will to act, and it makes judgments. But she said everything that guided those three faculties of the mind has fallen apart. Psalm says it this way. When the foundations are destroyed, where shall the righteous go? And so, my question is, when you think, when you act, and when you judge a thing, what is your compass? What tells you yes or no? When you vote, what tells you yes or no? When you say amen to a preacher, what says yes or no? When you watch something on television, what tells you yes or no? When you teach your children something, what tells you yes or no? If your capacity to think your capacity to will to act, and your capacity to make judgments. If all the moral compasses are fallen, who do you follow? And Paul is telling the problem with the Roman Empire is that they have no sense of direction. And then it says, and the answer to that is the life of the Spirit. Because if you're guided by the Spirit, you will be called huios tan theos, the children of God. Jesus says over there in John 14 and 15 and 16, he says, the Holy Spirit will guide you. Say with me, he will guide you to all truth, all truth. Yeah. Have you ever go to the court and see people swear on the Bible? What are they forced to say? Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing by the truth? I always wonder why are they making them do those three declarations? Why not just do you promise to tell the truth? You ever wonder why they do that? Why don't you just promise to tell the truth? Because there were people who would go to court and tell half a truth. And the, and the courts got, got wind of it and they said, oh, we got to add the whole truth. And then there would be people who would tell a truth but mix it with a lie. That's called slander. Or that's called misguiding, intentional misguiding. Some people call it perjury. You lied to the court. And so the, the courts got wind of it and they said, not only do we have to say tell the truth, the whole truth. Because some of us tell the truth, but it's part of the truth. 
especially if we're in an argument. Boy, we'll tell the whole the truth, not the whole truth, and not everything but the truth. And so the Holy Spirit is the person who when you're in that moment of decision what does the mind do the mind thinks the mind acts and the mind makes judgments and all of the world is falling apart anybody ever see fiddler on the roof you gotta get out there get out there it's a musical the opening of fiddler of of the roof the opening scene starts with a with with a guy on the roof a fiddler it's about a Jewish family that's migrating. The older father with the younger children. And the opening line is tradition, tradition. Tradition, tradition. And people's, the argument was, how is this new family going to be guided? By tradition or new ideas? In the end, it was neither. It was both. It was tradition and new ideas. But what gives you the power to make that decision? Question. Question. Most people who are between the ages of 25 and 30 are in a very important moment of their life. Between 25 and 30, and I'm making a generalization, you're deciding who you're going to marry. If you finish college, are you going to go to graduate school or career? If you're into ministry, what kind of ministry you're going to choose? That is a very, if you're married, am I going to have my first child or my second child? If you're single, am I going to marry this loser, I mean this person or not? Pastor, I'm 50. Could I revisit that? No, te casaste ya. No return policy, no refunds. And, and you need the voice of the Holy Spirit. Say with me, I need the voice of the Holy Spirit to guide me. But there are things inside of you wrestling to guide you in a different direction. Anger. Rage, lack of forgiveness, the dysfunction in your home that you want to repeat because you think because your parents did it, it was God. They're not God. They make mistakes. And when you're a parent, you're going to see how much not God you are. (laughs) And so we need, listen to me, we need to teach the church that the voice of the Holy Spirit is for every dimension of their life. Paul knew that. You know how Paul knew that? Because he was very sensitive to the direction of the Holy Spirit. Look how sensitive the the voice of the Holy Spirit was in the life of Paul. When he falls on the Damascus road, he hears the voice that says, you're going to go to this street. That's how specific it was. You're going to go to the street called straight. You're going to make a right. You're going to go up. You're blue. And there's a prophet there. So I don't understand how so many people say, but pastor, God doesn't speak with specificity. He doesn't got, he was telling Paul what street to make a right and a left on. He was giving him that level of detail. And so if you're lost, it's one of two things. Either you're not listening to the voice or you're still captive to the sinful nature. It's not that you're not hearing the voice. You're like, I like this better. This, this makes me feel so good. And so I have something for you. Hannah Arendt said, how is it that all these theologians, all these pastors, all these bright people began to follow the darkness of Nazism and execute Jews even though they knew the Bible? Anybody ever know somebody who knows the Bible and they use the Bible like a hammer? They use it like a whip? Because the Bible says, until you tell them the Bible says, Right? Because they don't have the guidance of the spirit of how to use it. It's like, that's why you don't give children a knife. And if the Bible's a sword, right? You don't give children, why don't you give children a knife? Because they cut the bread and their finger. They don't know how to discern the faculties of the mind. And in society, we're living in a very difficult moment where people are being manipulated. Hey, just because somebody's charismatic doesn't mean they're filled with the Holy Ghost. Just because they make you feel good, Coke makes you feel good, but it ain't good for you. I heard somebody tell their husband, you heard that, baby? (laughs) Say with me, just because it feels good doesn't mean it is good. And so we need, we need a compass. We need a direction. How do you know when somebody's preaching? If they're trying to manipulate you to take your money, to influence you? Or to use you to make themselves famous and not to make Jesus famous. 
And so what do we do? We begin to train people in the word of God and in sensibility and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Pastor, pastor ask me, pastor, how do I know it's the Holy Spirit? How do I know? You know it's the Holy Spirit because it always points to Christ, always. The Holy Spirit always points to Christ. Doesn't point to you, doesn't point to me, always points to Christ, always. Number one. Number two is the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit produces life, joy, and peace. Where there is no peace, the Holy Spirit is not there. Listen to me. Pastor, should I do this but I don't feel peace? If you don't feel peace, don't do it. If you don't feel peace, don't move. I know how many people have bought houses, married people, and they still had lack of peace and they did it. And now they're $300,000 in debt and divorced. The Holy Spirit gives you the peace that surpasses all understanding. He guides your thoughts, your actions, and your judgment. Look at me. You remember when the two women came to Solomon? You remember them? And one of them said, what did she say? He's my boy. She killed my boy, my son. The other one said, no, she's my, he's my son. Solomon could have, could have believed the first person who came to him. That's what we usually do. El primero que llega, ese le creemos. That shows lack of maturity. The book of Proverbs says, a man is right in his cause until his neighbor comes and reveals the rest of the story. And so you have to have the wisdom to hold back and say, not till I hear every dimension of the story will I not pronounce judgment. Never judge a thing before it's time. Never judge a thing before it's time. And so the Holy Spirit gives you the wisdom to have prudence and restraint. And Paul, hey, Paul wanted to go to a certain place. He was diehard. He's like, I'm going to preach. I'm going to have a revival in the Holy Spirit. You're not going. In the old, in the King James Version, it says, and the Holy Spirit forbade him, prohibited him. He said, you're not going. Thank God he didn't go. Because if he would have went, he would have messed up. He went later. God then later let him go. But if he wouldn't have went in that season, he would have destroyed God's perfect plan. The Holy Spirit guides your thoughts, your actions, and your judgment. He gives you restraint. Hannah Arant, listen to me. She's, she is a young student studying philosophy. She's Jewish in Germany. And one of her professors tells her, even though I've studied the Bible, right? You know what? I, I'm, I'm like so troubled. Germany was the place where there was the most theology. Luther came from Germany. Bonhoeffer comes from Germany. Bultmann, all these great people. And all of them followed, not all of them, Bonhoeffer didn't others, but a lot of them followed Hitler. How is it that you could come to church every day Read the same Bible. Y alguien te manipula. Can I talk to you? Can I talk to you? The Holy Spirit needs to open up our minds. There is a brand of Christianity right now that is pure. Pure, pure manipulation. And people just go for it. Right? People living extravagantly. People making money off of you on television, sitting in seats full of gold. And we're amening that. And I'm saying, where is the voice of the Holy Spirit that says, avarice is a sin. Yeah. Greed is a sin. And then it's not that God doesn't want you to prosper. There's a difference between prosperity and greed. Greed is a sin. Prosperity is when you prosper, you bless others. Greed is when I prosper, I keep taking. You're, you're the human vacuum. And my question is, we have millions of people saying amen to this foolishness. I ask you, where is the voice of the Holy Spirit in human conscience? We have people in political power speaking against people of color. And we have preachers sitting behind them saying amen. And I ask myself, where is the Holy Spirit? They talk about minorities and immigrants. And if the Holy Spirit is not here to confront abuse of power, what is he here for? And Hannah, she moves to Germany. 
she is sent by the new, one of the New York newspapers to watch the trial of Adolf Eichmann. Who is Adolf Eichmann? Adolf Eichmann was one of Hitler's henchmen who tortured people. She's there watching it. She's reporting. They asked, listen to me, this is what shocked me. They asked Adolf Eichmann, they said, Mr. Eichmann, why did you just kill Jewish people? Why did you send them to the gas chamber? Why? You know what he said? Look at me. I was just following orders. You were what? You made soaps out of human skin just because you were following order? There comes a time when somebody tells you something, no matter how powerful, how much money, whether they call president, governor, pastor, apostle, TV evangelist, there has to be an inner compass. Dile a tu vecino, prende el compás. Tell your neighbor, turn on the compass. Turn on the compass. And the compass has what? A needle. It's called the brujula. It tells you where's north and where's south. There's people. She writes an article called The Banality of Evil. The banality of evil means that you, let me give it to you in a real Spanish version, banality of evil. Eso no es nada. When you do something evil, but you minimize it. Anybody ever do that? When they were little, not last week, I'm just saying when they were little. You broke something, didn't tell your mother. Can I tell y'all a story just so I can show you my own sin? Once my mother went to a prayer meeting at, our, at the church. We lived two blocks away from the church when I was a little boy. My parents were pastors. That's why I have all these kind of emotional problems. <laughs> I'm okay. I've recovered. No side effects. <laughs> And she went to prayer meeting, and she left me with my two older brothers, Sam and Hector. Hector's two years older than me, Sam. And she's like, I'll be back in an hour and a half. I knew she wasn't because it was a Pentecostal prayer meeting, three hours. <laughs> and we were fighting. And I forgot if it was Hector or Sam. He took grape juice and he threw it. And I ducked, and he stained the wall. We were fighting immediately. That stopped the fight. Question, what were we thinking? As soon as that grape juice stained the wall, what was the, conver the inner conversation? How, how are we going to fix it before mom gets home? She's going to know right now because she's watching. I'm 42. She's discovering it right now. <laughs> Sam said, dad has paint in the basement. We painted the Hades out of that thing. <laughs> to this day, she didn't know we painted that thing. <laughs> and so there's a thing called the conscience. But even the conscience has fallen. The Bible says, even if your heart doesn't condemn you, God is greater than your heart. But I don't feel it in my heart. Your heart is deceiving more than anything. Who shall know it? I, sometimes I feel in my heart like slapping somebody. <laughs> Anybody ever feel that in their heart? Just like. <laughs> but it ain't about your heart. You're a Christian. It ain't about your political party. You're a Christian. It ain't about your boss. I'm just following orders. There are things that have an inner compass that says, I don't care if everybody else does it. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. And there are things as Christians we cannot do because the Holy Spirit guides our mind, our thoughts, our actions, and our judgment. But it's on TV, but 10,000 people liked it. I really don't care. My mama used to say, if 10,000 people jump off a bridge. Question, 
How is it that other things have more influence on our mind than the Holy Spirit? Who gave, who gave them that dominion? Who gave them that authority to form the way you think? The Bible says as a person thinks, so are they. So God wants to, yes, God wants to guide your mind. And he does that through the person of the Holy Spirit. And so in Paul's day, a lot of stuff was happening. And Paul was like, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Because the Holy Spirit forbids it. And so look at me. We're going into elections, right, in November, right? It, we better be praying. I don't care what Sean Hannity says. I don't care what Rush Limbaugh says. I don't care what Rachel Maddow says. I don't care what Chris Matthews. You notice I'm giving you the left and the right so you don't know where I'm at. It's not what they say. It's what my mama used to say, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand up tall on the word of God. And listen, we have to know the direction of the nation. We have to know what people are saying. Famous, a famous fable called the Pied Piper of Hamelin. Hamelin was a town in Germany. It's a fable. It's not a true story. The sta story says that they, Hamelin was infected by what? Rats. Remember this story? Rats. By the way, it is an extended metaphor for the bubonic plague that attacked Europe. That's where that myth came from. Rats invade Hamelin. They didn't know how to get rid of it until somebody said, there's a piper, piper, flutist, who has magical powers to guide rats. They, they say, come, we will pay you. What does he do? He starts playing the pipe. That's why he's called the Pied Piper. What happens? The rats follow him out of town. Yes or no? He leads them off a precipice. He liberates the town. See, that's the part of the story most people know. Let me tell you how the book ends. They didn't want to pay him. They refused to pay him because they got rid of the rats, the problem. He came back into town. They didn't pay him. He started playing the flute. <laughs> the children began to follow him. Because when we have an undiscerning adulthood, we have a childhood born in a nightmare. Because there were not adults in Germany that told their children, you do not discriminate against Jews. There were young children blaspheming and cursing Jews until an adult said, we don't do that in our house. We're Christians. My question is, where was the Holy Spirit? When stuff is going around in this country, when people say things about different groups, do you stand up? Where's your inner compass? No es que alabes a Dios, no es que sientas el Espíritu Santo, es como vives. It's not that you jump up and down, wow, great word. What do you live? Monday through Saturday, how do you act? How do you treat people? He starts playing, right? What ha y all, y all, see, the Pied Piper sounds like a good story until you read the last four chapters. The children start following him out. And the parents are screaming, we'll pay you now. We'll pay you now. Because you will pay up front or you will pay later but you will pay I am concerned that what we're preaching in the church is emotional experience but not Holy Spirit guidance I want my children to know the voice of the Holy Spirit why because when they're in a group that I can't follow my kids everywhere I cannot I am not omnipresent but the Holy Spirit can and they're, and they're in a moment of decision, and their kids are saying, take this pot, smoke pot, don't smoke pot. You are not a slave to the flesh, but you are a child of God. And if my son has the experience of the Holy Spirit, not a law, not a rule, the Spirit of God in him, he has the power and the authority to say, we don't do that.
And so my question is, the faculties of your mind, your thoughts, your actions, and your judgments, who guides them? The Republican Party? The Democratic Party? The customs of your culture? Who guides your thoughts, actions, and judgments? For if you are led by the Spirit, then you are children of God. Paul put it this way. You are a child of whatever you're led by. You are a child of whatever you're led by. If it's money and greed, you're a child of mammon. If it's fame and fortune, you're a child of the goddess Fortunia. Huh? If it's sensuality and hypersexuality, you are a god, you are a son or daughter of the goddess Aphrodite. Paul had a project. He was destroying idols. And those who are led by the Spirit, they're not children of Diana, Artemis, Aphrodite, Mammon. They're children of God. Look at me. It is time for the church to come of age. It's time for the church to become an adult. And make decisions not based on how well somebody speaks. Hitler was the best speaker in Germany. He was the best speaker. He was charismatic. You have to have your conscience seared by the direction of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I'm going to tell you how direct the Holy Spirit can be, even in the most minuscule thing. I was watching a newspaper article, and I finished with this, a newspaper footage, TV footage of news. And it's about a child. They abducted a nine-year-old child. Anybody ever see this? An African-American nine-year-old child, they abducted him and put him in the trunk of a car. The boy says, he's a boy, the boy says that while he's in there, he hears a voice. He feels it in his heart, and the voice tells him, sing. Sing loud in the trunk of a car. The boy starts singing. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. The voice is telling the boy, sing louder. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship is to our God. He's singing. The abductor is driving the car. It starts bothering him. Don't tell me the Holy Spirit doesn't speak. The Holy Spirit's power is so strong that it could take you out of the trunk of the car. And in case you're wondering what the trunk of the car is, it's the trunk of the car. He sings. The boy says he... The man pulled over. Hmm, the power of the Holy Spirit. He pulls over. He opens the trunk. And he says, go. He sets him free. Look, I, I, I don't have this mastered. I don't know everything. But if there's one thing I want for my life and the life of my family is to be more sensitive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit in my speech, in my thoughts, in my action, and how I judge a thing. Because if you sing, jump, shout, have great services, but the guidance of your Holy Spirit is not there, you can be like the children of Hamlin off a precipice. The sad thing is that the children were going off a precipice singing. Because you could be so manipulated that you're going the wrong way and singing all the way there. Yay! yay. But God is awakening a church of maturity that understands that the Holy Spirit speaks, guides, directs. Will you pray with me this morning? the gospel is not only words but Paul says that the gospel is power that once
you've come to Christ, that question is settled. You are a son of God.